Jackie, I read that piece. Uh, it was the yesterday, May 18th uh, column that you wrote, which was just phenomenal. And you take Watson's experience, and from there, you generalize and talk about barriers that are the barriers to voting, including really subtle ones that are going to happen from now until November, which, you know, frankly scared me. I mean, I could read Watson's story and my heart hurt, but then when I started to think about what might happen on a nationwide scale, I grew increasingly worried. Could you talk a little about what you were saying in that piece and what you're worried about for November? Yeah, and I also recommend um, anyone watching this to read Emily Bazelon's deep dive as well in the New York Times Magazine about protecting the vote come November. And it's really someone something that everyone should be talking about every mm -hmm. single day because um, things are changing in real time as Secretary of States uh, around the country are figuring out how to protect people, but also maximize turnout, or in some cases, minimize turnout um, and keep up these barriers to voting. So there's a few different issues here that range from voter registration um, to, you know, to actually turning out people to how people will actually vote. So are they going to go in person, potentially, you know, risk their health by being near other people in November with the pandemic, presumably, um, still, you know, being a pandemic, uh, or are they going to be, have the right to vote by mail, have an absentee ballot? Are they going to be able to actually even afford to have postage stamps to be able to mail that absentee ballot in? So these are all issues that voter rights groups uh, and organizing groups and campaigns are figuring out right now. Um, and it's taken on uh, obviously a whole new meaning because you know, when you are reaching out to someone, you're not just encouraging them to register to vote right now, but you you have to really help them figure out how exactly they are going to register. It's, you know, much harder to do when you're not having that in-person contact because as everyone is well aware of, all of that, you know, all campaign rallies, campus organizing events, those have all been put on hold. This is all being done through the phone, online, um, or through mail. And so having those creating and fostering those trusting relationships and getting people to actually follow through um, on these certain steps is, is challenging to do when you're not in person, when you're not having those face-to-face -face interactions and creating those relationships. Because uh, in, in political organizing, you know, relationships are really, as someone pointed out to me, the coin of the realm. Um, being able to create that trust so that at the end of the day, when it comes November, they actually follow through on getting their vote in in some way. Sophia, do you have any thoughts that you wanted to say on that point? Yeah, and I and I have, a again, a legal question. I just am flabbergasted when the President of the United States on camera says, without voter suppression, Republicans will not continue to be elected. I don't know how that's okay. And I don't know how it's okay that the President and Mitch McConnell are so actively working to torpedo the United States Postal Service because they're afraid of us being able to vote by mail in November. I, I don't, I, again, I'm, I'm very upset by the, you know, GOP leadership on this, but whether it was Democrats or Republicans, if we have leaders who are actively working to suppress an election, which is the foundation of American democracy and of, of this country, I don't understand how that's allowed. I don't understand how there is not an enormous bipartisan push to protect the election and the electorate. You know, our, our rights as American citizens are truly based on our ability to vote. And these, these elected officials are supposed to protect that because they've been elected by us to do so. So I'm, I'm just, I'm dumbfounded at how they could be so brazenly anti-American and face no punishment, censure, and anything. Are, are, are we just, are our hands tied because the no. president and the Senate work for the same party who, who are realizing that voter suppression is working for them? I, I don't understand how this is allowed. Which by the way, I think, you know, 
I, Neil knows more about this than really anyone else, but I also think it's worth pointing out. There are also no studies, there's no research that actually supports the fact that turning out more voters is beneficial to Republicans. So it's, you know, it's really a political talking point. Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question, Sophia. I mean, legally and historically, of course, this didn't start with Trump and McConnell. This goes mm-hmm. all the way back to the founding and three-fifths clauses in the Constitution and right. the abridgment of the right to vote for uh, African Americans and for women. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, probably the thing that I was proudest of during my time at the Justice Department was successfully defending the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Mm-hmm. And to, when you read that history, it's all about the same kinds of shenanigans that we're seeing today. Oh, move a poll a little bit later, require this form mm. of ID before you can vote. All the stuff that Jacqueline's column yesterday was talking about, you know, have antecedents in practices that have gone on for decades. And we had a law, the Voting Rights Act, uh, that had been used for years to try and police a lot of that. And unfortunately, just a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court struck down the heart of that act. And so it allows states now to really engage in these shenanigans. And Jackie's absolutely right. You know, there are some secretaries of state who are trying to increase voter turnout and have vote by mail and others, but there are others who are hell bent on not having any one vote who can't really, you know, do have the most dogged effort to get there and vote, which of course tends to be people who have more economic means because if you've got to go to your job or whatever, it's harder to vote or if there are hoops to go through or even if you're a college kid and, you know, you, you don't have a driver's license in the particular state you've just decided to go to college in or the like, you know, there's all sorts of ways of restricting uh, the vote. Um, and yeah, there shouldn't be anything more un-American can than mm-hmm. leaders of either party saying, oh, we're trying to suppress the vote or make up things like voter fraud, like Chris Kobach, the Secretary of State in Kansas, who, you know, I actually went to law school with and, uh, you know, I, I thought of him as a as a reasonable fellow back then, but he's really, I think, drank the Clorox uh, at this point and um, off, you know, off of any sense of sanity or any sense of science. I mean, again, it's, it's a little bit connected to what we were talking about before. They pretend that there's like some rampant voting fraud problem. But actually, when you look at the stats and numbers, it's never there. It's never, ever. Never, yeah. never. So I, I, I guess it's strange to me that they're allowed to keep saying it. Again, it bothers me as a citizen that leaders, I don't even feel like I can call them leaders anymore. It's like I have to air quote it, which is so irritating to me. But that leaders are lying to us and facing no punishment. You know, you're, you're not allowed to lie in many arenas of the world. And it's, it's, it's just so odd to me that this has become kind of normalized. And, and I, I guess I wonder, I even think about it actually, before I I ask this question, you know, Jacqueline, in your line of work, the number of times I, I'm reading my newsfeed on Twitter And I see news outlets just quoting the president or quoting Mitch McConnell in a lie and not stating in the tweet, the president misrepresents X by saying or blah, 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 which is a lie. (laughs) They're, They're not identifying. So in a way, I worry about, you know, again, data that shows that so many people just read the headline and don't bother to read the article. I'm like, hello, where are the requirements for a lot of these news outlets? And, and I wonder, do you guys think from both the, what you see in, in the world of journalism and what you see in the world of law, what are our best bets as citizens for combating this stuff? Is it to get involved with organizations like Represent Us, which you know are working on anti-corruption, working on vote by mail campaigns, Represent Us, one of the reasons I like it is because it has 87% bipartisan support. So the most conservative to the most liberal voters agree on the stuff that Represent Us is doing, which makes me feel hopeful because everyone's telling all of us we're never going to agree on anything ever again. What is that what you'd recommend as a first step? You know, what do we what do we do about this? Well, from a media perspective, I think that 
you're completely right in that a lot of media outlets need to hold themselves to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. You know, that means that tweets that say that the president recommends that we drink bleach in order to ward off COVID-19 in giant parentheses, it should say, do not drink bleach. That will not you know, cure the, the novel coronavirus. Um, and that, that applies to every statement. And I find that in, with this administration, most media outlets really fact check every single thing that comes out of the White House. But it is our responsibility to make sure that, that we are doing that, you know, across the board and that mm -hmm. we're not just stenographers, but that we're putting out information um, for, for, for public consumption um, that, that is factually accurate. Um, but, you know, I also think this gets at the bigger issue of news literacy in America uh, mm -hmm. and problems with our education system, which I'm not going to go into right now, but that, you know, America has one of the lowest news literacy rates in the world. Um, and that it, it should be something I think that everyone, you know, invests a little bit more in so that um, Americans are able to take care of themselves, especially amid a, a global pandemic that is permanently killing people. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of The New Normal with Sophia Bush and Jackie Alemani. Stay tuned in the next couple of days for our final segment with the two of them as we talk about news literacy and the youth vote.